The next speaker is Shiap Shama. Shiap Shama is professor of electricity engineering. He trained at Imperial College London and did his PhD in Stanford University. He is professor at Maryland University and also work at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. He is an internationally recognized expert of the functioning of the auditory system, including in particular cortical sound processing in both animals and humans, and his application in audio engineering and audio prothesis. He has made major experimental and theoretical contribution concerning the basal functional organization of the auditory cortex, its representation of complex sounds such as speech, and its encoding of pitch and timber. He recently focused on the role of, the rapid, plastic, of rapid plasticity in the auditory cortex and showed how this plasticity is controlled. So he will now discuss the role of rapid plasticity in the enhanced performance of, the aud of auditory tasks. Shia? I'm behind. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm really glad to follow Amir because uh, you can believe everything he said and take it and I'll just build on top of it. Um, I think the main message uh, that I took was that the cortex is an incredible learning machine. That's probably what distinguishes from all other animals that we have just such an amazingly sophisticated learning machine and we just have uh, this ability to learn concepts and things. I think Amir emphasized how quick it is uh, within minutes. I'm going to do the extreme version of that um, and uh, focus on learning and quote unquote plasticity, but at really rapid scale. Things of the order of as we speak, as you listen to me, and the orders of hundreds of milliseconds or less. And the claim is that learning it involves basically uh, uh, some form of adaptive processes that change the synapses, change the networks, and therefore change the functionality of the cortex, auditory, visual. And um, sometimes these take long time scales, which is what we traditionally refer to as plasticity, following evolutionary time scales or injury and uh, learning over long periods of weeks and months and so on. But really, it's difficult to actually draw the line between that and between the kinds of learning that you do uh, in extremely rapid scales as you pay attention. Uh, if you're walking down the street and suddenly you pay attention to something, the entire understanding of the scene has changed, although the stimulus has not changed at all. And uh, so, Something in your brain changed, and that has to be some physical uh, manifestation of that is your synapses got modulated, and these things can be extremely novel. It has nothing to do with learning in the past, and so it's not that there is a network already built there and all you're doing is you're switching between the two. You're learning as to perceive things as you experience them. So. Can we call this plasticity? I don't know. Some people really don't want to. That's fine. You can call them an adaptive process, but it will be difficult to come up with a clear de distinction between these things. So I'm going to focus on this rapid plasticity. And uh, one of the consequences of that is that what you see and what you hear is not really what is in the stimulus. It's really how the brain interprets all of these things. I think it's pretty clear. Now, uh, as I, I know uh, some people here who are clearly auditory, but I gather that a lot of people here are not from the auditory world. So Christine told me, just like she told Amir, that, and when Christine tells you to do something, you do it. <laughs> and so I'm going to do it. I'm going to review for you the auditory system in two minutes also. Um, so uh, the auditory system has a lot of synapses before it gets to the cortex. And uh, if you start at the bottom where there is the cochlea and sound comes in, uh, there are a series of nuclei 
from the cochlear nucleus and the first uh, station. Is this a pointer? Ah, can you see the red dot? Yes. Okay. So there's the cochlear nucleus. Then you get to the brainstem where there is the nuclei that do uh, the uh, comparison between signals coming from the left and the right, and they give you spatial information about the sound. And then you get to the, uh, this is the lateral lemiscus, and then the inferior colliculus, where all pathways coming from the many, many different nuclei in the auditory system converge. And this uh, structure receives massive feedback from the cortex, so it's a real true junction. And then you get to the thalamus. So from here all the way up to here is kind of like acoustic retina, if you will, from the anatomical point of view. The retina has a lot of synapses too, and there's a lot of processing going on, and this is really all the primitive early processing that occurs in the auditory system before you hit the thalamus where the nucleus is the medial geniculate body, which is the exact analogous of the LGN in the visual pathway. And then you get to the uh, cortex. I'm going to spend ev all my time essentially talking about the uh, cortex, because uh, it seems to be that much of the adaptive things that we see in the auditory system are really uh, quite dramatically expressed at the level of the auditory cortex and beyond, and not so much at the lower levels, although there is some plasticity that has been measured uh, lower, including due to perhaps feedback coming from the adapted cortex all the way down. Okay. Now, I think the auditory system is pretty clear now. By the way, just to make you feel better, there really is a huge gap of knowledge on what's going on here. But we're going to ignore that and go to the level of the cortex. So the representation of sound at the level in the auditory system is much like Amir showed you, which is the so-called spectrogram. There is your piano keyboard from low frequency to high, and there is the activation as a function of time. And that's the kind of activation you get when you, uh, uh, when you talk or when you have music and so on. And this kind of so-called tonotopic or frequency-based organization survives through many, many synapses all the way up to the cortex and a little bit uh, uh, even in, 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 in the auditory cortex. There are many stages of processing, as I'll talk about. Now, in the auditory cortex, the early processing in the er auditory uh, cortex looks remarkably similar to what you have in the visual cortex. So you have things that look quite analogous to the kinds of processing you see in the visual cortex, exactly as we just heard. There are equivalent of orientation selectivity, uh, there's uh, binaural and monaural, that is one ear and two ear inputs going uh, you know, represented at the level of the cortex. Um, there's, uh, people have emphasized the temporal dimension in the auditory system for obvious reasons. It's probably quite similar to the visual, but in any case, as far as I can tell, from all the auditory and visual studies of temporal processing, there's remarkable similarity between those two. Ra very strong responses to the onsets of stimuli. So if I play you on a piano, you can tell immediately the onset of a sound, and it's much more difficult to tell the offset, and, uh, and so on. Um, and so this represents here uh, is the feature selectivity that you see at the level of the auditory uh, cortex, where each of these is representation of the selectivity of a cell in the auditory cortex two features in the input, which is, in the case of the auditory system, is the spectrogram. You can, by the way, think of the spectrogram as a one-dimensional retina. And there is your retinal axis from low frequency to high frequency is spatially organized, just like you go horizontally on the retina. And that's how it evolves over time, which, of course, nobody looks at static images. You almost always are looking at images that are varying on your retina over a function of time. 
And so this is looking for features in the spectrogram to respond to. Um, and for example, this biggest one here has features that look oriented over time. So this would be probably what uh, Amir was referring to, to sensitivity to sound that is going down in frequency or going up in frequency. Broadband, like in the case of that L or I, uh, would be search cells that are broadly tuned, and so on and so forth. So all of these features exist at the level of the primary auditory cortex, the input region that receives uh, incoming uh, activation from the thalamus right below. But that happens even when you're asleep, even when you're anesthetized. Probably not when we're dead, but <laughs> as fMRI studies have shown that dead salmon does have. Uh, however, when you're actually engaged in real listening, you do much more than that. Uh, so when you're listening to one talker, and if you take the signal coming out of a microphone, and let's just represent it here with this pink waveform, if you have two speakers saying different things, you get this sort of uh, pink and green activations representing when you open your mouth and you generate ah, uh, e, u, and you know different sounds, and you add them together, it is completely trivial for a human to focus on one or another speaker. And this is a very tough, uh, uh, computationally, uh, technologically, a very tough uh, task to do, because we do this without any learning, without knowing who's speaking or even caring about their language. But we can, on the fly, focus on one person or another, and we use any other cues available, for example, visual and, and so on. So presumably when you're attending and you engage in a task and your cognitive uh, functions kick in to tell you, I really care about this speaker and not that speaker, Perceptually, what happens is only the pink becomes enhanced and the, and the green is not. So I'm going to talk about that a lot as examples of how kind, the kinds of modulations that happen in your cortex as you listen to these kinds. But just since this is an auditory talk, what I'd like to do is just play you some uh, auditory demos of the kinds of processing that happen even when you're not intending for it to happen, because you cannot help but interpret the complex scenes in certain ways that are driven by your cognitive functions, even subconsciously. So uh, this is a nice demo from um, uh, Bregman, and if you're interested later, I can give you all the full references and all that. What you're listening to here, again, this is the frequency axis here, and there's time. And you're listening to the red sounds here, which uh, will sound like So this was uh, low, you know, high to low, and then Now, what happens is if you add these little black notes, these are black just to let you see it with your eyes. But what you'll hear is that this uh, second one the one that goes up becomes more difficult to distinguish, to tell that it's going up as opposed to going down. And uh, you can test this objectively, but I'll play you that and you'll see. Right? Now, now what you could do is long before you hear this complex, I'll play you a bunch of sounds that have nothing to do with these red tones. But what they do is they bias your brain and pull out the black tones and make them sound like a separate speaker and leave the red tones alone. And now all of a sudden the red tones become very clear. So these are really trivial demos of what happens when you're listening all the time. You're constantly doing this kind of thing. Your ability to listen to the red tones has basically changed over a short period of time. And this is really short. This is less than half a second. And another demo. Uh, 
when you, as I said, I showed you this uh, spectrogram before for uh, speech, and you, where red is is where the main activation in the signal. So this is sort of like you're playing on a keyboard and you just play the melody with the one notes instead of playing chords all the time. So you can uh, do this with the famous uh, speech uh, called sine wave speech. Probably those of you in vision have not heard this before. But people for a while thought this would be a great analog of sketches. Except it doesn't quite work like that because if I play you the first sound here, Probably very few of you understood it, uh, but if you're in the auditory world, you might have heard it before and all that. And so I'll play it one more time, and then I'll tell you what it says, and then hear it again, uh, if, you haven't, if you didn't understand it. It sounds like a whole lot of whistles, but he's saying my dog bingo ran around the room, and now you can hear it. And it completely sounds like speech. Why on earth you didn't understand it first? And all it took is I told you some new sentence, and now all of a sudden, that's now stored in your memory, the sentence I told you. Your processing is completely changed. All of this kind of stuff happens on the fly with adapted synapses and networks and all that. And finally, a very famous example in the auditory world, and since this is an auditory visual symposium, I'm sure some of you have seen it, but those of you who didn't, this is played a lot in the auditory world, although it's demeaning to the auditory world, but we're very open-minded. Um, this uh, person is gonna say, uh, is gonna say something, is gonna say, if you look at him, he'll be saying da, 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 da. But if you close your eyes, he changes what he's saying. And he knows exactly when you close your eyes. So as he speaks, close your eyes and open them, close your eyes and open them between the syllables and see how you hear it. Ba, 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 ba. Did it change between da and ba? Yeah. So this just shows you how instantaneous this effect is of having a visual input that biases you towards hearing it one way or the other. And, uh, okay. So this is very rapid plasticity or rapid adaptive process. And the way we study this is in humans and animals, this is gonna be a bit of a gyrating experience because I'm gonna switch you from studies in animals with single units, recordings and single neurons, all the way to uh, measurements with EEG on humans performing tasks. The animal that explains the first slide you saw is the ferret. It's an animal that is uh, a very good auditory capabilities and you can train them to do all kinds of tasks of attention and learning and so on. And uh, uh, usually they're sitting in a tube uh, licking uh, water to tell us that they have detected something because they're thirsty and they would like their reward and you can record in their brain while they're performing these tasks. And when you record those receptive fields I showed you earlier, like these, you remember I just showed you earlier, these are the features that are available in the auditory cortex to detect one feature or another in the spectrogram. What, what you can do is, as the animal is doing the task, you can measure these receptive fields in different contexts. When the animal is looking for the sound or the animal is attending to that sound, and, and so on. You can change their context. You can change their behavioral state. And what you see is that um, if you measure, for example, if you look here down below, if you measure from one neuron and you uh, see that the red represents the sensitivity is heightened, the cell here is tuned to around eight kilohertz, 8,000 hertz, and uh, it has inhibition on either side. So it has a certain pattern in response to features in the spectrogram that look like that. However, when the animal was trained to detect a particular tone as a warning tone, and that tone happened to be near six kilohertz, this neuron changes its selectivity and becomes more sensitized towards six kilohertz and not to what it used to be. And the point of this is that the more neurons that are sensitive to this warning tone, the more likely it is to uh, 
perform better at detecting it and therefore avoiding punishment and getting the reward. So these kinds of changes can happen very quickly. And um, I'm going to tell you how quickly you can do these uh, uh, changes because those experiments were done in little blocks so that you can measure these uh, receptive fields. So for example, you measure for 5-10 minutes in one state and you measure 5-10 minutes in one state and you see these changes happen. And this is a movie from one cell that we managed to record from, from two hours and it was doing tasks that are completely different. It's not about tones, it's about click rates going from tick, tick, tick to trrr, and the animal has to detect the difference between these. So in order to do that, it needs to enhance its temporal or its time sensitivity. And the way it would show up in a receptive field like that would be that this uh, area of big activation, which used to happen already 30 milliseconds after time zero here, in an animal that is really interested in doing fast time detection, this red region moves all the way forward and it becomes much rapid responder to, uh, to these kinds of signals. So just to illustrate for you, I, I mean, there are a lot of details that obviously I can't go over here, but the, the acoustic track tells you whether the animal is passively listening or is engaged in the task. And when you hear noise, that means that the animal was just passively listening. And what you'll see is that as soon as the animal engages in a task, this receptive field jumps over and changes. And then when the animal stops, over a period of few minutes, the receptive field relaxes back to its original state. And then when the animal engages again in the task, it shifts again and then takes time to relax. So this is the task and the receptive field changed. And now the animal is relaxed and this receptive field slowly retracts back to its original state after about an hour or so. And then after an hour and a half, we did the task again and immediately jumps and then relaxes back again. So these changes can happen very quickly. And the hypothesis is that if the brain is a great learning machine, whatever it has to do in order to learn is going to involve these things first. You cannot learn without paying attention. You cannot learn without, um, you know, whatever, for example, having expectations, imagination, uh, making decisions, all these cognitive functions, really important. All of them modify these receptive fields. So this would be the first step. And if the animal has nothing else to do other than detect clicks, then it becomes a world expert at detecting clicks, and these changes become permanent over time. So I'll show you examples of those. OK, one last example, I think, of auditory, which is really amazing, that illustrates something called contextual effects. This is sort of similar to uh, the first uh, demo, but this is, this is a French demo, so I have to show it. It's by my colleague, Daniel Pasnitzer, here at the Ecole Normale. And those of you who haven't seen it, uh, it's quite a remarkable demo. What you'll hear is a sequence of tones you've never heard before. Uh, chords. I mean, they change a little bit in frequency. And then there's a gap. And this gap can be, by the way, as long as a minute or two. And then there's two test tones at the end. And those will feel like they're changing in pitch. They're either going up or going down. And I want you to tell me if they're going up or going down. I'll ask you at the end of each presentation. So how many people heard them go up at the end? OK, the majority of people here. And now let's hear it again. Go down. And those last two tones were identical, exactly identical. And in fact, Daniel and Claire have shown that you need just one presentation of those things at the beginning, as short as 16 milliseconds to bias your brain to hear it up or down. The more, the better. 
And you can have a big gap here in order to, and you maintain the memory of that. If this thing happens in an audience that has never heard it before, had no reason to assume that it will happen, completely involuntary in some sense, but you needed to pay attention, by the way. I did make you pay attention to the sound. So imagine what happens when you're listening to somebody and you really don't want to hear them. Or imagine you really want to hear what you want them to say. That's the origins of misunderstanding. <laughs> so expectations, imagination, everything is a context to the stimuli coming at you and modify your, uh, your presumably cortex and therefore affect the way you hear things. So I'm just going to show you a few examples of how we study this uh, to elaborate. So this particular stimulus is really quite beautiful because uh, in the gap here, you can look at the state of the brain. You can look at the state of neurons or, or, or a human listening to this and look at their EEG and so on. And you can ask, what is different? Why is it different in the gap before you hear those ambiguous sounds at the end? And you hear them either as going up or going down. So we study these in ferrets, where you have them listen to these sounds and then uh, interrogate what happens in the gap between the biasing tones and the test tones. We've done that in people, exactly the same stimuli. And so you can get an idea of what the view looks like from the ferret with single unit recordings telling you the different pitches that the animals are hearing and why do they hear up from down and what is so different. It's exactly the same identical stimulus. And in people, you can do MEG, EEG, and so on to, to do that. Um, and that's how you interrogate basically the adaptive processes that happen very quickly. A little bit more extreme, something you can't really do in a ferret or uh, in, a, in a volunteer, uh, which is you open up a human brain with a big uh, hole. These are the ECOG experiments um, involving uh, many groups, but this kind of beautiful experiment was done by Eddie Chang and uh, Nima Masgarani. Nima is in Paris right now, actually, for two weeks. Uh, exactly elaborating on the studies that he's done on the human brain, as I will describe in a second, but uh, making computational models and uh, pattern recognition models to explain this kind of thing. So um, uh, in these subjects, the, uh, these are the ECOG experiments with the epilepsy patients where they open up and put the electrodes and then they can do experiments like that with humans because you can ask a human, uh, please pay attention to the female or ignore and ignore the male or vice versa. So you put the same exact mixture in the brain of the, uh, in the ear of the human, and then the, you ask them to pay attention to one or the other. It's possible to do this with ferrets, but it takes more work. It takes a few months to do, and not quite as, uh, anyway, not as well as the way humans do it by simple instruction. So that's really why you're pushed to go to EEG and MEG and, and ECOG if you have the ability to do that. You can do quite nice cognitive functions quite easily. But when you do this in humans, so you present, you present uh, the uh, voice of the female and you record the activity in the brain of a, of a human, uh, you see this pattern of activation representing what the female said or you see this pattern of activation, what the male said when they're speaking alone, individually. So that's the female speaking, and that's the male speaking. Now you add the two, and you ask the subject to pay attention only to the female, or pay attention only to the male. And what you see is on the same exact electrodes, within less than 100 milliseconds, the pattern of activation that comes out of the same electrodes to the same exact mixture changes from this to this, depending on what the subject paid attention to. So these are fresh sentences. These are things that are not learned. These are voices that the people have never seen before. And somehow there is uh, 
the ability to just adapt your cortex and make it a, basically a filter that fits only the female and ignore the male. And we can't really do this technologically on two speakers, as trivial as it is for us. I always think the most trivial things for humans are the most difficult for technology and vice versa. So math is really tough for humans, but computers can do beautiful math until it becomes conceptual. But you can do this, by the way, with, with EEG now, with MEG, you can play two speakers and record the EEG and the signal and ask people to pay attention to one or the other, and you can track the EEG signal and show that, in fact, it matches exactly the target speaker versus another. So you can do really nice experiments now. You can even do speech recognition almost with these EEG signals. That's how much information there is in the EEG. And, and it's available if you know how to uh, uh, track it. So these adaptive processes can be studied now with imaging uh, quite rapid and much more suitable than, for example, fMRI for auditory is quite tough. And, um, and actually, there are now projects, uh, several projects around the world attempting to do exactly that, which is read off the EEG and interpret the attentional focus or your decision or your um, imagination and so on and use it to control a device, for example, in this case, a hearing aid, to track the attended speaker. People, as you know, who have difficulty uh, hearing have a really hard time focusing on one speaker or another. And so if you can read off in their mind who they want to attend to, you could perhaps do beamforming or make the microphones directed to one speaker or the other. So it's the ultimate goal. Now, to go back to that uh, fantastic um, uh, ECOG example I showed you, um, can you do this in single neurons um, in a ferret? Uh, so, the, th and the reason I'm going to show you this is because these experiments actually tried to measure how quickly it, it is, how quick this process of adapting is, to try to get to that question. Uh, because uh, presumably a lot of these cognitive functions involve much higher cortical areas that have to somehow send their signals down to the auditory pathway and, and modulate the activity. And so, so uh, just to illustrate one concrete example of that, uh, so you remember I showed you this uh, example of two speakers, and the red, I'm sorry, the pink and the green speaking, saying two different texts. Well, actually a much simpler stimulus that we can actually study in a ferret would be one that mimics exactly that. So what you see in a two people speaking, and they're speaking different things, so it's easy for you to focus on the green or on the, is that people speak in each other's gaps. If you look at any two sentences, plot them out with different colors, you see this kind of pattern that the green comes in the gaps of the pink and all that. The more gaps there are, the easier it is for us to pull out the clean stuff of the green or of the pink. Well, if you match it, this would be like saying speaker A, red, 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 and speaker B, gray, 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 or green, green, green. And I can replace the speaker by just a single tone. I say high tone and low tone and alternate them. And then I can ask you, please focus on the high tone or the low tone. And you can do that right away. So you'll hear it like here. It's very easy for you to focus on the, uh, on the high tones or on the low tones and report things about them objectively. Um, so on the other hand, if these two speakers say exactly the same thing, it's very difficult, despite your impressions. So if you have a choir singing in unison with the soprano and the bass, and if the soprano makes a mistake, and I ask you who made that mistake, 50% of the time you probably say the bass. Because they were all acting as a single source. They were all saying exactly the same things. You can objectively test this. On the other hand, if the soprano is singing a different text from the bass, and she makes the mistake, it's trivial. So that's exactly when we use the word one stream, it's like one source and you can answer questions about them as one source as opposed to two sources.
So why does this happen in the brain? Why, how can we do that? Well, really very simple hypothesis is that you immediately adapt with, in the case of two voices, what you want to do is you want to focus on one and ignore the other. So they're competing against each other. And so competition means I want to suppress the enemy. And the way it happens is if you have neurons that are driven by the A speaker or the B speaker or tone, then they create mutually suppressive interactions between them. They try to shut each other out. And so you get this sort of what they call mutual inhibition or uh, global suppression compared to if they're saying the same thing and I want to treat them as one speaker, that would be like binding. I want to bind everybody together. So, uh, so you can test this. You can measure from neurons in the brain as they're listening to this or they're listening to this or right after or during or from the onset all the way through. Many different ways you can measure this. It's easy to do with tones in a ferret. It's much harder to do it with speech in a ferret, but it's doable. Um, so anyway, when the animal is passive, not paying attention, you see that the measurements in this state or in this state look just the same. So these are measurements of the receptive fields from many, many neurons in this state. From the same exact neurons in this state, the measurements look exactly the same. But when the animal is engaged in a task where they have to pay attention to these sounds and discriminate one or the other, you see that there's completely different responses in the case of the competitive or mutually inhibitory or the two-stream context versus another. So you can measure that. You can also measure when do these begin to appear. And you can see, you can measure that within about 50 to 100 milliseconds, these adaptations become complete. So this is extremely rapid. And it's happening, you know, we. Um, with, with, with will power, that is the animal listens and says, oh, I will get my reward only if I do this or do that. And that's what drives them. And you can measure the correlations and so on. So let me just quickly, I have five minutes, 10 minutes? How much more? I don't know because we started. Okay. Let me take you a little bit further up. In the ferret, so this is another uh, tutorial on the auditory system, we, just like the visual cortex, have many, many areas. A whole region in the auditory cortex responds to sound, sometimes better during different contexts and all that. And um, if you look in the ferret brain, you see that the primary regions are here. These are receiving direct input from the thalamus. But there is a progression of secondary areas and tertiary areas, and God knows what. And they all respond to sound in more and more sophistication, perhaps, when we use the word sophistication when we cannot figure out what the heck they're doing. <laughs> and that's literally, unfortunately, the story. It's very difficult to interpret. They seem to respond better when you have more complicated things in the sound and all that. Tones don't excite them very well. And, um, and not only that, but if you go to this area, which I'll talk about in a little bit, this is the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex responds to sound beautifully, but only when the animal is engaged in a task which involves, and, and the animal is responding to the meaning of the sound. So they respond to the meaning of these stimuli. So they respond to sound, but to the meaning of the sound, and not just any sound. So uh, how you study that? Well, again, you go in A1 like I showed you, and you study the plasticity that happens here. Then you go here, and you do the same task. So what's different about these than this? And what's different about the tertiary area? And how does the sound make it all the way to the other end of the brain? There's connectivities, presumably. We don't know for sure. but So these animals are really well trained. No volunteer human would undergo this. So these animals listen to these tones, and every day they get their food and water when they do their job, and they detect them, and all that. So I just want to show you what happens when you do this over a period of time in these different areas. So this is the primary area, 
This is the uh, secondary area. This is a tertiary area. And these responses are responses to stimuli that were very similar to the stimuli they were trained on, but they were not exactly the same. They were not in the context of a task in the sense that the stimuli were not in exactly the sequences that the animals associate with the training. Okay? So this is very much like the Braille learning and all that. By the way, I don't know if Amir knows, but Braille was invented right across the street. So we can't say anything bad about Braille compared to <laughs> auditory inputs. <laughs> OK, so um, the red lines are showing you the responses to the, uh, to the train, eventually become training stimuli. But in a way, it's like to think of it as a naive animal. And the blue are to the sounds that are safe, very similar to the red sounds. For example, click trains going tick, tick, tick versus trrr. And the trrr, if you detect it, you get a reward, and the other one you don't. So the red is, not, is the exciting stimulus. The blue is, is the, let's say, boring stimulus, the reference. But this animal is naive, has no clue. So there's no difference in the response. They look very similar. In an animal that has been trained for a long time on these two sounds, you already see differences even in an animal that is passive. So this animal was not paying any attention. His brain or her brain, these are female ferrets, have been adapted and rewired. And basically, these stimuli now evoke distinctive responses, the reward ones versus the boring ones. In all of these regions, about the same kinds of differences, maybe a little bit better in the more tertiary areas, compared to no differences at all in the naive animal. So this is evidence of learning that is passive, learned, and permanent, so to speak. And now when you take these same animals and put them in a task, and what happens is in the, in the secondary areas, you get very big magnification in the differences of the responses to the rewarding stimuli versus the learned stimuli. So you build these adaptations on top of what's already learned. And, um, and uh, this, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, the uh, frontal cortex. So when you go to the frontal cortex and you stick an electrode and record exactly the same kind of stimuli, the frontal cortex simply does not respond much in the passive, at least in these kinds of tasks, in these kinds of paradigms. And it only responds to the exciting stimulus and not at all to the other stimulus. Now, it, and so what it's doing, it's basically extracting the meaning of the stimulus and, and not just the physics of the sound. OK, in the interest of time, I was going to talk about decision making. And uh, since I just mentioned the, the, uh, the um, uh, frontal cortex, and since Jennifer and Eve are sitting in the audience right there, I thought I'll mention some really beautiful experiments they're doing now in the ferret. And what this ferret is doing, I don't know how they managed to train this animal to do this, but they listen to a whole cloud of tones. <laughs> And then suddenly there's a subtle change in the density of the tones over a certain small region in the spectrum. And so it sounds like something, just, just really trivial difference. And people can do it, and ferrets can do it. They manage to get the ferrets to do it. And they record in the brain while the ferrets are expecting that change and when, they, when it happens and all that. So here there's a huge change in the sound when there's an onset of the sound. And here there's a really subtle but it's the key, because you only get your water if you detect the change. And when you record in the brain, so Jennifer recorded there, uh, the responses in the primary auditory cortex, in the early area. And what you see is that the cells respond strongly to the strong physical change and the onset of the sound, but almost no change at all, very small differences uh, to the subtle change. 
If you go to the frontal cortex and you look at the auditory responses, you get the exact opposite. This sound changed huge sounds at the onset, which is meaningless, by the way, for the animal. It doesn't evoke much response at all. But you get a huge response to the subtle change that means everything about the reward. So this is a magnification of the meaning of the stimulus compared to. And that obviously happens only in the brain of a ferret that gets its living or its water from these kinds of uh, paradigms. OK, um, I was going to tell you about imagination, but I think you can imagine what I was going to say. Basically, when you imagine something, you set up your brain to hear it. And people have been doing recently experiments like that with ECOG. It's really beautiful. You can have, this is a patient, actually, I met in Paris, who ended up in uh, UCSF, teenager. He's a good uh, pianist, and he played a Bach with all these electrodes in his head and all that. He trained it, he practiced it many, many months beforehand in Paris, but he had epilepsy. And so he went to Eddie Chang's group, and he played the piano as the electrodes were there, and they were recording in the auditory cortex, and you get beautiful patterns of responses to the music, as you might imagine Bach produces in your brain. But the best part is that when you turn off the sound and you play the piano, you get the same patterns of activation in the head of, the, uh, of this. Uh, so a well-practiced task, like you talking, probably evokes a lot of activity in your brain, even when. So it's, uh, that's the kinds of imagination, expectation, already hardwired circuits, who knows. Um, so I'm done. I just, this is the summary. I just want to say that we uh, adapt our brain with all resources we have. And I'm focusing on the cognitive because that's the flexible one. Uh, usually with permanent changes that happen because of learning or memory or as you act, as you live with attention, decisions, and even when you have expectations and imaginations, all of these engage very rapid adaptive processes that modulate your circuits, modulate your brain, and if these get repeated again and again, then they become permanent plasticity. So it, this could be really essentially a gradual process going, it's a question of time scale. Where do you want to study this? And uh, so plasticity is a huge wide field, and uh, it's really difficult to pinpoint exactly what is not plasticity. Thank you. Thank you.